morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And today, we're going to do a little bit of review. So we're going to look back a little bit, look forward a little bit. But first, I'm going to kind of let the new people know what we're all about, and then review, remind some of you what we're all about. C3, Christ-centered church. Christ is the head of our church, not Pastor Gene. Right? So how do I know what to do? What the Word of God says. Simple as that, right? So we don't add anything to, we don't take anything away. So there's not a lot of silly programs here, not a lot of fluff, not a lot of extra stuff. It's just God's Word. That's what we're all about. That's how you get it right. That's what the church should be. Now, last week, we talked about, and we do talk about, a lot of very kind of like typical Christian teachings, modern Christianity, not biblical Christianity, right? So how we've taken our world and we've put it on top of this. That's what we do, right? So we take our government and put it on top of this, and we see everything through that lens, that's wrong. That's how we get it really, really wrong. So there's all these like Christian easy kind of teachings out there. And so people struggle reconciling the world with the word when the key to the whole thing is you got to throw the world out <laughs> and just pay attention to the word and see everything through this. And that's the accurate way to do it. This just came on my heart. I'm going to go for it, I probably shouldn't. So there were Supreme Court rulings over the weekend, right? And this is difficult for pastors because you have both, both blue sheep and red sheep. People don't know that, right? They think all the sheep in the Christian church are red. That's not true. And so when you're seeing it this way, you know, it's different. Right? So I'm not going to talk about any of the rulings, but I, I heard a person, a Christian, out there praying. She said, I've been praying for this for years, I want you to think about that for a minute in this context, looking at things through the lens of the world versus the word. What's wrong with that? Don't answer. <laughs> What's wrong with that is this. I've been praying for our government to come in and save us. What? Here's the right prayer. Jesus changed their hearts. That's the right prayer. You see? So... We see it wrong, right? You, you might have seen that on TV or whatever, but you might have thought, that's really cool. No, it's not. <laughs> but we believe that. No government is going to, that's not, read this to the end. Read this to the end all the way through. So that's, that's the topic today. That's, we're going to be talking about a lot today. I finished this. I've read this all the way to the end. I'm not finished with it. Trust me. I read it all the time. But when you read to the end, it's Jesus who comes and solves everything. Everything. There are no more problems. Don't worry about it. We are citizens of heaven. So this stuff, yeah, it matters, but it matters to get people to Christ. That's it. That's our job. That's a main thing. Tell them about Jesus. If they don't listen, see ya. That's what it says. That's it. We're looking forward to heaven. So it calms a lot of nerves. Here's the thing. People don't read it all the way through. So you get what I like to call Thief on the cross Christians. You ever hear people use this? The thief on the cross. So if you haven't been in Christianity for a while, you might not have heard this. But if you've been a lifelong Christian, you've heard this thinking. So Luke 23. This person has gotten to the third gospel. One more chapter to go, but they give up. They give up right here because they like what they read. Here's the backdrop. Jesus is being crucified for our sins. Not so that we can sin. <laughs> for our sins. And he has like criminals that just make it easy to understand, on either side of him. And one of them begins mocking him. Really? You know, like, you're the Messiah? Get yourself off the cross then. And us too, by the way, while you're at it. And the other criminal on the cross is like, whoa, don't you fear God? We're criminals. We deserve to be here. He doesn't. Turns to Jesus. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Thief on the cross Christian. That sounds great. <laughs> but there's 27 books of the New Testament. This person's only on the third one. There's a lot of clarification. What they do is they use this to say, I don't have to do anything. I just believe in Jesus, and just like the thief on the cross, I'm with him in paradise. 
But that's not at all, as we've seen, what the rest of it says. So you view it like a commentary. Each successive book is a commentary on the one that came before. It's really important. You get to places like Romans and things like that. And then you get to James, and it'll clarify a little bit. And we got to do both sides of the coin. That's what we talked about last week, right? So faith and works. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. They go hand in hand. They go together. But pastors like me run into a lot of thief on the cross Christians, right? They've closed the book. And here's the funny thing. Like, imagine your favorite movie right now. Think about it, right? And then someone only watches like one third of it. <laughs> or they jump. I've talked about this before. They jump all over the place. And they go in and tell you what that movie's all about. You're like, really? You're crazy. But Christians do this all of the time. And so pastors have very difficult conversations. It's like they'll come in and they'll try to, man, this is another discovery I'm having. Pastoral work, <laughs> modern pastoring is nothing like what Jesus did and Paul did and everybody. We ask like 20 million questions so that you self-discover. Jesus really didn't do that. <laughs> So we do, and so we'll be nice, right? We'll ask all these questions. So we run into this person, and we start thinking like, oh, well, um, have you been baptized? Because they just, I believe in Jesus, that's it, I'm getting in. Have you been baptized? No, thief on the cross wasn't baptized. Are you attending a church? Thief on the cross didn't go to church. It wasn't a church yet. Anyway, but he didn't keep reading, right? He didn't get to the beginning of Acts. So, you know, you keep trying. Well, do you read your Bible? Thief on the cross didn't read the Bible. And soon a pastor will get to a place where he says, you know, look, and this is where you turn into like more like Jesus now or Paul or somebody like that. You say the difference between the thief on the cross and you is that the thief was dying in his belief. But you are dead in yours. Now, here's the thing. Those of you who have been here for a while might be panicking a little bit because you're like, normally he starts with a joke, right? And so, <laughs> you know, like, like he softens us up and gets us ready, and then it gets gradually harder and harder and harder. He talks really, really fast through all these scriptures, and then like, bop, 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 you know what I mean? And then prays for us. So where is it going? Like, what is going to happen now? Does this mean it gets easier? Or what is harder than this? I don't know. Or, or just don't overthink it. How about that? Maybe there's really no plan at all here, and I just, I don't know, whatever. So just relax. That's the joke right there. That was your joke. <laughs> all right, so recap. we got to do a little <laughs> review. I'll explain a few things to you here as we go along. We're in the rest of the story. As I said, we believe in the Word of God, and that's just not like the favorite places. We believe in the whole thing. Right? It's all equally the Word of God. It's not like, oh, well, you know, this part of it's more important. <laughs> no, it's all the Word of God. And I'm trying to teach you guys how to see it rightly, what's in it, what's going on. But let's just do a little bit of a technical recap here. So if you've never read the Bible before, and you have to assume that, right? We can't be like all up here all the time. We're going to assume you never read the Bible before. You probably know about King David, right? So there's our frame of reference here, King David. All right. You might know he has a son. So it's after the whole Goliath thing, right? The son is Solomon. And you might think, oh, yeah, he was really rich and really smart. Mm-hmm. But not so much, <laughs> because Solomon ended up breaking every single rule for the kings of Israel. Every rule. You see it in Deuteronomy 17, I believe. Every single rule. <laughs> and so God, paraphrase, approaches him. He says, look, you know, I should destroy you, but for the sake of your father David, I won't. It'll happen in future generations. And then we get Rehoboam. He comes along, and sure enough, immediately, bad decision maker, you get the split of the kingdom. So just think like a civil war. So Jeroboam in the north, Judah in the south. So Judah, Solomon, or Rehoboam at this point. And so they're going to begin warring, but before they do, Israel is technically a bit worse. All right, so they set up the calf idols. This is to prevent people from worshiping where the worship should be in Jerusalem. So they're trying to stop that. There's all this political stuff going on. But their succession begins to happen by murder. Like, so they start murdering one another, and this is how the kings go along. But David's dynasty continues, and that's what we're looking at right here. Books of the Bible. We're in 2 Kings now and 2 Chronicles, and they largely run in parallel. So you have different books of the Bible talking about the same accounts, 
the same things, but we've seen they give us slightly different details. So think of it like maybe 2 Kings is written first, Chronicles, the chronicler comes along and says, eh, well, let's add this, or let's talk about this, or, you know, just differences. Kind of like the way the Gospels work. Right? Same basic story for Gospels. That's where we are. Then, on top of it, and here's why the Bible's so confusing, is because these prophets happen during that time, but in the Bible, they're all the way over there. <laughs> so they're not even close. And so you go, oh, what, what is going on? So I've been trying to put all this stuff back together for you, put the prophets kind of where they belong, and try not to make it too confusing. So what happens in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles is you have this kind of cut scene like you see in movies. So meanwhile in Israel, then meanwhile in Judah, and so sometimes they're happening at the same time, but they're in the next chapter. This is exactly where we find ourselves today. So we looked at some prophets. Micah, right? We looked at Hosea, not to be confused with King Hosea, right? We looked at Joel on Pentecost, because Peter, what? He recites a whole bunch of Joel in his sermon on Pentecost. So we looked at those books, but before that, this is why we need the recap, 2 Kings 16, King Ahaz, he is really wicked. Now he ends up closing the temple, and we had to go to 2 Chronicles to get that information. Then it's a whole bunch of meanwhile. There's like a whole bunch of prophets that happen. There's all this stuff we saw last week, King Hosea and Israel. He's defeated, so the northern kingdom now falls to the Assyrians. They're taken into captivity. They're gone now at this point. And now everything is going to focus on Judah in the south. So that is David's family, David's line, many, many generations afterward. That's where we are. So we're back here in 2 Kings well, let's look at 2 Kings 16 first. So this is 2 Kings 16, and there's the parallel. So we can bring that up. There you go. So there's Ahaz. So when he died, he was buried with his ancestors in the city of David. Then his son, Hezekiah, became the next king. And 2 Chronicles, a little shorter, but about the same. But look, he was not buried in the royal cemetery, right? Because he was bad. He closed up the temple. Bad. All kinds of idol worship. Then, last week, 2 Kings 17. So Israel now falls. Now, boom, here's Hezekiah, 2 Kings 18, 2 Chronicles 29, running in parallel. Did I just skip the chart on you, Robert? Yeah, there you go. So there it is. Some, I did not draw that again. The biceps would be much bigger if I drew that. <laughs> but anyway, just to have some fun, that's basically how these things are running in parallel. It's basically ish. So you can, I think we're going to put it on the app probably, but uh, you can look at it then. So that's to help you understand how these things are going. So let's go to 2 Kings 18 now. 2 Kings 18.1, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, began to rule over Judah in the third year of King Hosea's reign in Israel. So that was the last chapter. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestor David had done. Kind of the same. But what did he do? Second Chronicles will continue on. In the very first month of the first year of his reign, Hezekiah reopened the doors of the temple of the Lord and repaired them. So he reverses his father's decision. So he's going to do this. And so what happens here is, if you're following along, I'm just going to shorten it and paraphrase through quite a bit just to get to where we're going here today. Interesting, last Week, listen. We saw that the Lord wants us to listen. He starts telling the Levites and the priests, listen to me, this is what we have to do. You got to get to work. Purify yourselves, reopen the temple. So the reopening of the temple will happen over like 16 days. So it takes eight days just to get in there, and then another eight days just to kind of like reopen it, purify it, do all this stuff. And we're going to see a big list of Levites, so they name everybody. So you, this is what slows a lot of people down in the Bible, right? You get this huge genealogy, this person begot this, or the son of this. So I'm just not going to go through all that with you today. There's a whole bunch of Levites. Imagine that in priests. So if you don't know what these people are, priests are like a priest, like you would see in a more traditional church, not me. So, you know, they offer the sacrifices. They're allowed to go into certain parts of the temple. The Levites are from the same line, but they're more like worship helpers. Like, so these could be worship leaders. They'll help the priests out in their duties. That's really the difference. That's it. But here it's interesting because it notes that the Levites are actually like doing better somehow than the priests. They're more pure. They've purified themselves better somehow. Just an interesting note. 
So if we turn the page, 2 Chronicles 30, basically, to summarize, he sends letters out to everybody. This is Hezekiah. And it says, come celebrate this Passover. And if you don't know, there are three pilgrimage festivals that the Bible outlines. It's in the Law of Moses that all the Jewish people have to go to the temple and celebrate. It's mandatory. Passover is one of them. It's the real big one. Very, very important. Pentecost and then booths in the fall. Those are the three. So he sends letters out. Some mock him, but some come. And they have this massive Passover celebration. And it's very hard in our context for us to imagine it, like what it might be like. Literally, thousands upon thousands of animals being sacrificed. PETA went nuts, right? So it was really, but it's hard in our cultural context to imagine that. So you either, you have a farm or something like that, and you take the best, the first of, of your flock, your animal, you have fruits, because there's all different kinds of offerings, and you're going to take it there, offer it to priests. You don't sacrifice it. He does. He's the only one who can do it, right? So this is what you must do. Very, very important. So it's absolutely massive. Big, huge festival. And remember, this is a command in the law. They should have been doing this the whole time. So he's reinstating all this stuff. Hezekiah is, for now, doing pretty well. If you keep going, not only that, he's going to reinstitute, like, all the daily sacrifices. There's supposed to be daily sacrifices, too. So he gets that moving. And it's interesting, just a little side note, he commands everyone to support the priests and the Levites in this work. And basically, he says, you need to tithe to them so that they can devote themselves to the work entirely. And this should remind us, this repeats in Acts 6. Right? So the apostles, the teachers, they need to be in the word all the time. So they get the deacons going and they say, you go do all the other stuff so we can be in the word in prayer. Right? So we got to get our sermons ready. That's really important. So it's an interesting note here. Devotion. They're devoting themselves. This is a, a big thing. So right in the early church, what did they do? Tony was talking about that. They devoted themselves right, to prayer. They devoted themselves to the worship, to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to fellowship, to being together, the Lord's Supper. Right? So devoted. And so we talked about that. It was big last week. They didn't just go, check, right? I showed up. Now I'm going to go watch the game. I don't care. Right? They, spent, <laughs> they spent a lot of time with one another. So devoted to everything they did. So again, if you're new here, that's what we're about here at C3 Church. I'm right? devoted to the work. That's what I do for the majority of my week. Right? That's why I know it. That's important. So whatever we're doing, we're devoted to it. But if you know me, if you've been here for a long time, you know I'm devoted to you. Right? So we like that. We're family. I'm going to be praying for you. I want to know everybody's name. I want to know what your needs are. So devotion. It's very, very important. So here's what we see getting reinstated. Hezekiah, they were not devoted. They were like, whatever. Kind of like the church today in a lot of ways. But he devotes himself to it. So here we go. We're going to devote ourselves to the Lord. Now, we run into a different situation. Assyria conquers Israel in the north. Now they're high off that victory. They turn around, and they're going to go south. So they're going to go after Judah now, after Hezekiah. And so that's the backdrop as to what is happening right now. Again, the chart. We run into these three places, 2 Chronicles 32, 2 Kings 18, and now Isaiah 36, if it wasn't confusing enough. They're all the same-ish. <laughs> they have different details, but all three of those sections of the Bible are about the same. They're detailing the same thing. A lot of people don't know this. They think, ah, oh, Second Kings, that happens. Maybe they know Second Chronicles, but they have no idea that the same account, it's almost the same as Second Kings, <laughs> is here. It's happening here, but it's all the way over there in your Bible. So let me just read this part to you, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go through it, paraphrase it again. Second Chronicles 32.1. Pay attention to this. After, after Hezekiah had faithfully carried out this work, okay, so store that sentence in your head. After Hezekiah had faithfully carried out this work, King Sennacherib of Assyria invaded Judah. He laid siege to the fortified towns, giving orders for his army to break through their walls. When Hezekiah realized that Sennacherib also intended to attack Jerusalem, that's the capital city down there, he consulted with his officials and military advisors, and they decided to stop the flow of the springs outside the city. They organized a huge work crew to stop the flow of the springs, cutting off the brook that ran through the fields. For they said, why should the kings of Assyria come here and find plenty of water? We're not going to help them out. 
Then Hezekiah worked hard at repairing all the broken sections of the wall, erecting towers, and constructing a second wall outside the first. He also reinforced the supporting terraces in the city of David, that's Jerusalem, and manufactured large numbers of weapons and shields. He appointed military officers over the people and assembled them before him in the square at the city gate. Then Hezekiah encouraged them by saying, be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria or his mighty army, for there is a power far greater on our side. He may have a great army, but they're merely men. We have the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles for us. So here, 2 Kings 18, Isaiah 36. A little different, shorter beginning in the beginning of Isaiah, but kind of the same-ish. So here's basically what happens. So at first, Hezekiah's like, you know what? I've done wrong. I'm going to pay you your tribute. So not exactly the right thing to do, right? So he's doing all these things, but then all of a sudden, he's like, no, 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 no. he's basically going to pay him off. <laughs> 11 tons of silver and one ton of gold. To get it, he strips the temple, basically. <laughs> Great, Hezekiah, but this doesn't work. It is nevertheless, the king of Assyria goes after him. And so we have an exchange. They take up a position outside Jerusalem. And you got to remember, like, imagine like these three ambassadors. So three people come up and it's kind of like an exchange outside the wall. And so Hezekiah, he calls for Hezekiah, but Hezekiah doesn't come out. He sends his three guys out to talk to him. So you have like maybe a conversation just outside the wall, right? So they're just, just outside there. And in these movies, you always wonder why aren't people just like shooting the, <laughs> the ambassadors? But no, they have a conversation right out there. They're not getting shot at. In fact, they're quite bold, they're very bold. So they bring up two points. The first one is Egypt. Why Egypt? Well, because here we're going to see that sometimes they'll either pay other countries, think of it that way, off to help them out. You know, they recruit them, and we see that going back and forth. So the first thing they say is, look, you think Egypt's going to help you? <laughs> the king of Egypt, unreliable. And he gives this weird analogy. Like, it'll be like you're leaning on a broken reed. It'll splinter and break your hand kind of thing. Don't rely on them. Then they start mocking God. They say, you think your God's going to help you? No way. Right? What other gods help their people? So they go on and on, and they're just insulting. They say, look, you're weak. In fact, we'll give you 2,000 horses if you can find that many people to ride on them. Even with Egypt's chariots and these horses, it's not going to do you any good. So they're really going hard in this exchange. So hard <laughs> that Hezekiah's people say, shh. No, 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 no. You, you can speak to us in your language. <laughs> or make probably. You could speak to us in your language so the people won't hear. <laughs> we can understand it. So they're getting nervous because these people are quite bold. The people are hearing. It's a bad situation. And so they let them know. They're like, do you think our master sent us only to talk to your master? No. The people should hear because there's going to be a big siege. They're going to starve to death. And then the Bible does say this. They're going to eat their own dung and drink their own urine. It says that in there. So it's really bad. It's really graphic. So they're going on and on and on, but the people are pretty obedient. They don't listen to it. They don't answer back. <clears throat> they basically give them an offer like, you can come. We'll take you to a better place. It'll be nice, you know, lush pastors, but nobody listens. They're going to stick it out. So they went back to Hezekiah. They report all this stuff, and he does something that we might not understand. Tears his clothes, and he puts on burlap. Some people say like sackcloth. So just imagine it this way. You do this when you're mourning or you're grieving. So imagine like you really want to like convince everyone that you're really upset about something. So you put on like a wool sweater in the middle of the summer. <laughs> There's no way you are going to be able to be happy about anything with that sweater. So <laughs> that's what happens. So you, whenever you see that in the Bible, that's what they're doing. They're ensuring the fact that they're going to be like, you know, absolutely miserable, just however you would look with a wool sweater in 90-degree weather. But my daughter does that. She wears, she's fully adjusted to Florida. She wears, like, knit sweaters in the heat. I'm like, how? I don't know. Anyway, he tells me, go to Isaiah and tell him what's going on. So here we have Isaiah, son of Amos. He's the prophet. Go to him, tell him what's going on. Let's see what's going to happen. Well, Isaiah basically just gives him good news. Again, listen. This is what's going to happen. The word listen is in there again. He's going to get called out. So basically, the Ethiopians are going to attack him. Another army is going to attack Assyria. He's going to have to leave. But he's going to get killed, too. So send that back. Sure enough, this is what happens. He gets called away. 
not killed just yet. Before he goes away, he sends Hezekiah, another one of these nasty messages. And Hezekiah, this time, he spreads it out, the message, before the Lord in the temple. And he begins praying over it really faithfully. He's really putting his trust in the Lord. Complains a little bit, but then puts his faith. Now, Isaiah sends another message, and we'll put it up. 2 Kings 19.20. Then Isaiah, son of Amos, sent this message to Hezekiah. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I have heard your prayer about King Sennacherib of Assyria, and the Lord has spoken this word against him. The virgin daughter of Zion despises you and laughs at you. The daughter of Jerusalem shakes her head in derision as you flee. Whom have you been defying and ridiculing? Against whom did you raise your voice? At whom did you look at with such haughty or prideful eyes? It was the Holy One of Israel. You're messing with my people. 2 Kings 19, if we jump ahead a little, 32. And this is what the Lord says about the king of Assyria. His armies will not enter Jerusalem. They will not even shoot an arrow at it. They will not march outside its gates with their shields, nor build banks of earth against its walls. The king will return to his own country by the same road on which he came. He will not enter this city, says the Lord, for my own honor and for the sake of my servant David. So there we go. This is his line. I will defend this city and protect it. Jump ahead a little more. Here we go. 2 Kings 19.35. That night, the angel of the Lord went out to the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. When the surviving Assyrians woke up the next morning, they found corpses everywhere. Then King Sennacherib of Assyria broke camp and returned to his own land. He went home to his capital of Nineveh and stayed there. One day, while he was worshiping the temple of his god Nishrach, his sons, Adremelech and Sherezer, killed him with their swords. Nice kids. Then they escaped to the land of Ararat, and another son, Esaradan, became the next king of Assyria, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah. So, <laughs> trying to make this easy to understand. So, we've been talking about prophets weaving through these accounts. Two prophets are to Assyria, what we're talking about here, Sennacherib, to Assyria specifically. And so one of them we already looked at. Remember Jonah? We've looked at that one in the past. That's the whole deal. He doesn't want to prophesy to them. He doesn't like them. Hard to figure out where that one goes. You can speculate, but whatever. There's another one, Nahum. Nobody reads it. It's three chapters long. It's to Assyria. So it mostly concerns itself with judgments against Assyria. So let's just take a look. Nahum 1.15. Now, here's the thing. I'm dropping it in here for a reason. I'll get there. So with these judgments, he will often give hope to his people. So he'll say, look, you know, you're going through this bad thing now, but in the future, I got good news coming. So, look, a messenger is coming over the mountains with good news. He is bringing a message of peace. Celebrate your festivals, O people of Judah, and fulfill all your vows. For your wicked enemies, this is Assyria, will never invade your land again. They don't. They will be completely destroyed. So that you can put in there too around that time. People debate about where he actually goes, but I would put it about there. So we've talked about this in the past. There's no such thing as a New Testament Christian. And so a lot of people will not look at all this stuff. There are a lot of Christians that they, no, it's all the Old Testament. It doesn't count anymore. <laughs> but Paul, other places, they tell us, all this stuff exists so that we learn from them. That's the purpose of it. And Paul says that. Now, a lot of people don't know this. Maybe you'll learn something today. I've talked about it in the past, but it was a while ago. The New Testament is 30%, about 33%, about a third, Old Testament quotations. So think about it. You can't be a New Testament Christian. There's no such thing. A third of it is Old Testament quotations. So it is all being written with the expectation that you know it. Think about it. You're reading it. You don't know the context or what anyone's referring to if you never watched that movie. You don't know what they're talking about, really. And so we're going to kind of get there today. So it's very, very important. So we did this when we looked at Joel, I think. We looked at Romans 10, 13. We saw, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And there's another quote of Joel. That's what that is. A lot of people don't realize that because they're not reading it. That's Joel. They also don't realize what happens if we keep reading? This is where it gets really interesting. Romans 10, 14. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him unless, oh, sorry, if they have never 
heard about him. Excuse me. And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? This is what the scriptures say. What do you think Paul is referring to? The Old Testament. How beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. And that is a mashup of Nahum 115 that we just read and Isaiah 57 too. Isn't it interesting how it all comes together? How can, no, here's the thing. I don't think feet are beautiful, <laughs> right? But that's not exactly what they're talking about. They're not talking about, you know, paint your toenails, right? <laughs> not that. So how beautiful are the feet? Right? How wonderful is it that someone will deliver me the gospel? How beautiful is that? How wonderful are the feet that deliver that good news, the shoes of peace, if you're familiar with the word. How can they believe, though, if no one preaches to them? How can anyone know about this if nobody does anything? It's a point to consider. You see, there is our part in this. I've done that, you know, I don't know if you know a lot about art. Escher, the hand drawing the hand. God is working with us. It's both. It's another hard thing for people, right? So they get the thief on the cross, Christian, they're like, I'm out. But that's not what the rest of it says. We're not, like, called to do nothing. We're supposed to, do, we're supposed to have beautiful feet, right? So we're supposed to get this to people. We're supposed to have devotion to this. So we're saying Jesus is Lord, right? He's, I'm going to have, think about what you're saying, I'm going to have eternal life in him because he got crucified for me. But I'm done with him. What? I'm done with him. That's really what people are saying. I'm done. I don't want to hear what he has to say to me anymore. I'm done. And then I'm not even getting to the gratitude part. Devotion. So think about it in context of what we're looking at here. Hezekiah. He did some stuff. He was really devoted. He devoted himself to restoring the worship. Hey, we got to worship the Lord here. Come on, guys. Let's get going. He devoted himself. He did stuff. Right? Then the Lord moves in amazing ways. He reopens a temple. He purifies the priests. Then they have the Passover. I mean, think about it. He fortified not just one wall, two walls, <laughs> the towers, the defenses. He does his part in this thing. He does his part. Then he still prays. He lays out the letter, but pray. He's doing stuff the whole while. Then the Lord moves. Then the Lord kills 185,000. Think about that. Bam. Okay. You see, Hezekiah had faith that God would help him. But first, he put in the work. Think about it. You see, God's got this if we go to him. God's got this if we obey him. That's an important part. People don't like. We've talked about it in the past. Faith and works go hand in hand. Works are a product of our faith. So if we're thinking, remember I taught you guys the parable of the sower, beautiful initiation of like the parable ministry that Jesus does there. So the seed, the word of God, it gets down into you. It gets in there if your heart's right. And then what does it do? Jesus doesn't say nothing, right? So the seeds of the word of God, it gets inside you. And really, that's, it just makes you feel really good about everything you're doing. It doesn't say that. It said it grows. And when it's in the right soil, it produces fruit 30, 60, 100 times. That's a lot. It produces a whole lot of fruit. So think about it that way. Remember this. Your works are the product of your faith. They go hand in hand. If you're not bearing fruit, those of you who've read the Bible know what Jesus says about those. Chopped down, thrown into the fire. It's serious. It's serious. Now here's the thing. We're going to talk about like reading the rest. Now here's where the thief on the cross Christian, they made it to John. And they made it to chapter 6. And then they're going to quote this back at me, right? Even though they've never read the rest and they don't understand the context. They're going to say, well, you know, the only work, this is what Jesus says to the crowd, the only work I need from you is to believe in me. 
Context there is he gives that teaching about eating his flesh and drinking his blood to chase them away because all they want are signs and wonders, works. <laughs> That's the point. Then he turns to the disciples and says, you're going to leave too? <laughs> That's the context. But if we keep reading, you'll see this. You'll, you, might, you might get to James. It's good. James 2. Jesus is Jesus' brother, by the way. Knows him kind of well. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it with your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Think about what's being said here. Think deeply. Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm, and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. That's the Word of God saying it, not me. That's a major clarification to a lot of bad teachings. The Word of God tends to do that. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue. So he knows it's going to be lawyered here, right? Some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? That's a major clarification on John 6, isn't it? You see, we show our faith by our works. That means we have to put in the work. That's it. That's what it says. Now, here's the thing, and, and, and there are both sides of the coin. There are different occasions. There is a time when the Lord calls us to wait on him. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Not negating that. There is a time for that, but that's not most of the time. And if you look at those people writing that and giving that encouragement, like David, they do a lot of stuff, right? So David just doesn't go, I'm done, right? Like, okay, Lord, we're good. <laughs> no, no, no. He's not just sitting around doing nothing. It's very important to realize. Paul, did he do nothing? No, no. He put his life on the line constantly to be those beautiful feet everywhere he went. Constantly. Shipwrecks, beaten. It was crazy life. You don't want to go on a mission trip with Paul. It's dangerous. So he does a lot of stuff. But here's like what Christians do. And I'll give you another garden analogy. And first of all, you got to know something. I have a black thumb. Like I that, that's it. You know, if you have a garden, don't let me in it. It's just going to be bad news. And so, but this is kind of like what Christians are like to me. This is, this is what I see. So, garden on. Maybe you have like a little plot of land, you know, and here in Southwest Florida, you're not going to get anything to grow anyway because it's all sand. But anyway, you have this little plot of land and, and you want to grow a garden. It's been a dream of yours, but maybe you're like me, right? So maybe it's me and I know I can't grow it. So here's what I'm going to do I'm going to pray that the garden grows by my faith. We're going to give that a try, right? And it's possible. It's totally possible. So, you know, by my faith, Lord, grow the garden. So I do this for a day, and I'm like, well, it's got to rain first. So I'll just keep praying next day. By my faith, Lord, grow this garden in Jesus' name, right? That's what Jesus wants. We know that. Then all of a sudden, you're praying the next day. By my faith, Lord, grow the garden. Doorbell rings. You're like, huh. So you check your ring cam, right? Who is it? You wait for them to go away because you don't want to interact with anyone socially. You get to the door, you open up the package, and then you pull out a packet of seeds. That's weird. You put it away. By my faith, Lord, grow the garden. Let me pray that again. The next day, grow the garden, Lord, in Jesus' name. Doorbell rings again. Another package. It's a little bit bigger this time. You open it up, and there's a whole bunch of garden tools in there. And you're like, what's that for? Whatever. I didn't order that. All right? Next day, by my faith, Lord, grow the garden. Make it grow. Ding again. All right? It would be awesome if someone's ring thing went off right then and there. <laughs> I could have manufactured that now that I think about it. But by <laughs> grow the garden. Doorbell rings. You go there, and it's a hose. I need a hose? I didn't order that. Next day, by my 
faith is not growing. By my faith, Lord, grow the garden. Ding. Again, what is it? A watering can. This goes on day after day after day. No garden. And then you start asking the Lord why, right? Why, God? Why isn't the garden growing? Because he gave you everything you needed to grow a garden, and you did nothing with it. That's why. The Lord doesn't always answer the same exact prayers that like, we want, but he gives us the resources and the tools to get that same job done. The seed, the garden tools, the hose, those are all miracles. He was answering your prayer just not in a way that you thought. It happens all the time. I see Christians do it all the time. All the time. So Paul gives this example, which is kind of interesting in 1 Corinthians. So the first problem in the Corinthian church, I've talked about this before, pastor worship. That's what they're doing. They're doing what people do today. Oh, I love so-and-so, and and I watch all his YouTube videos. He's so amazing. No, God's amazing. That person's not amazing at all. And that's what Paul is saying. People are not amazing. (laughs) God is amazing. And that's it. But they're like, oh, Apollos, he's such a good speaker. Peter, that's the lead apostle. He's so great. Paul, eh, not so much. Right? So they're starting to worship certain pastors and developing factions in the church. Well, I follow Paul. I follow Apollos, and Paul gets really mad. He goes on a four-chapter rant about it. I'm glad I baptized none of you, except all these other people, Crispus, Gaius, Stephanus' household. He's very mad at them, so mad. Imagine a pastor saying that, like, like flip it. I'm sorry I ever baptized you. What? So he's mad. He says, do you want me to come with a stick and beat you? (laughs) Chapter 4, he says that. Right? Or in love, like it gives him a choice. Right? Which one do you want? He's not happy. But he gives an illustration that's interesting. So if you're in chapter 3 in the midst of it, he gives this illustration, I think it's verse 6, where it's, listen, I, Paul, I planted the seed. Apollos, you watered. But it was God who caused the growth. Now what's Paul's point there? We're just workers, you know what I mean? We're just gardeners and stuff. Like, don't Look to us like that. Only look to God like that. But you see what he says in the midst of it? I planted. I did something. Apollos did something. All for the glory of God. And so that's how it works. First, we have to till the soil, right? Then we have to plant the seed. Then we have to water it. Then God causes the growth. It's important. There are times when we do nothing. And those are wonderful miracles to see. And it's usually when we're not even praying for it. It's amazing. But too many people calling themselves Christians will say that's all we ever need to do. A thief on the cross Christian. That's it. But that's not what the Word of God says. When we obey, the Lord is faithful. That's what it says. And that obedience requires faith. It's all about setting our eyes. Because you might say, how? How do I do this? Life is so hard, right? Or, uh, and something came up, or this is happening to me, or I'm going through this thing here. Pastor, you don't understand. That's one of the funniest things people say to me in my life. They come in my office and they go, you don't understand. (laughs) Really, you're the only human being who's ever come into my office with a problem. I understand. I go through stuff too. It's hard. I have a family. I have a wife. I have a daughter. There's always something happening. So how, pastor, how do I do this? Well, the Bible tells us we are to fix our eyes on Jesus. You're not God. I'm not God. But God came here like us, setting aside some of his divine privileges. He's divine. He's all God when he's here in the flesh. But in a human body. And he allowed them to nail him to a cross. I don't know if I'd do that, just being honest. Think about that. That's how you get over yourself. You're not God. Get over yourself. That's what Jesus is saying. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow me. There's the formula. It's in there, trust me. That's what we're to do. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus. And if we want hope in something... 
the new heavens, the new earth. No more tears. No more problems. No more suffering. No more sickness. No more pain. Focus on that. This world's terrible. That's what the Bible says. It's not good. So, as we wrap up, I want to do something pretty interesting that I guarantee most people haven't seen. Maybe Tony, right, because he was a former pastor. Maybe he knows this, but it's really where it gets interesting, and it'll tie right in beautifully. So we looked at John 3.16 last week, and then I showed you John 3.17. Maybe some like people get there, amazingly. <laughs> but I want to look a little before it, and I'll show you something that most people don't talk about. It'll tie right into what we learned today beautifully. That's what God, God's Word does. So, context. John 3. Jesus is having a conversation with a religious leader named Nicodemus, and he's explaining to him the concept of being born again. Nicodemus doesn't get it. Right? He's like, so what do I do? Crawl up in my mother's womb and like come back out again? Like, what, what is this? And he's like, uh, She's like, you can't understand earthly things. How are you going to understand heavenly things? Right? So the Son of Man, he's going to talk about him descending from heaven. The Son of Man came down from heaven. This is the concept. Then you get to John 3, 14. It says this. As Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Then John 3, 16. That's what precedes it. Now, a lot of people don't understand what he's talking about. Moses and the what? What is he talking about? So I'll give you a little context, and then it's going to get interesting. Numbers 21. The people are complaining to Moses. They're wandering around the wilderness, and they're crabby. They're complaining. We hate this horrible manna, food from heaven. Like, we're sick of that. We don't want, we don't want food from heaven anymore. We're done. So what God does is he sends poisonous snakes to bite them, and some of them are dying. It's bad. Moses intercedes for them. That means he prays for the people. And so God says, you make a bronze snake. You make it. Put it up. When the people look at it, they'll be healed. They'll be okay. That's what Jesus is talking about. The Lord heals them. So no, Moses does something. Then the Lord heals them. Now what Jesus is saying is that when people look to me, they'll be healed forever. Forever. That's what he's saying. So he's using, yeah, Moses, bronze snake, they got healed. But now the Son of Man is going to be lifted up. And whoever fixes their eyes on him, they'll be saved. Now you know that. Check this out. One more layer and I'll leave you alone. <laughs> Second Kings 18.3. We go back to Hezekiah's reforms. Hezekiah did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestor David had done. He removed the pagan shrine, smashed the sacred pillars, and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke up the bronze serpent that Moses had made because the people of Israel had been offering sacrifices to it. The bronze serpent was called Nehushtan. Bet a lot of you didn't know that. That's where you get the name of it. Now, how much more depth does John chapter 3 have? You got all that going on. And what Jesus is basically saying, like, you should know this. It's all there. It all points to me. Beautifully. Think about the depth of this story. Wow. God planned all of that from the beginning. It's all about putting our faith in Jesus, looking to him alone. Jesus plus nothing looking to him. I'm going to pray from the scriptures for you this morning. God's word is better than mine. Hebrews 12, 1, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people, then you won't become weary and give up. I pray for strength for everyone this week. We know that this is a fallen world. I pray that hearts are changed. The power of your Holy Spirit, all glory and honor to God forever and ever. 
Amen.